Hello there. Welcome to the wrap-up show for The Case Season 1 Boston. Uh, today we will be talking about Episode 1, Jennifer. It's kind of started off this whole thing, this whole uh, the whole case. You know, we kind of got the backstory introduced to Kirk and, and everything like that. So I am Justin. I intern for The Kirkman Hand Show, and I'm also joined by Harrison today, who also interns for The Kirkman Hand Show. How are you doing today, Harrison? I am great. Uh, That's awesome. It's, it's my debut. That's on, right. On the YouTube channel, on any YouTube. That's right. Channel. What better way? Yesterday, and he's yeah. correct about that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, what a better way to debut than uh, than with the first episode of the case. I yes. before we kind of dive into it, let's just talk about like if we enjoyed it or not. Obviously, you and me, yes. it, it was very, very much enjoyable. I. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I thought it was it was quick. It was over before you even realized you were listening to it, and that's in a good way. It was so smooth. It was so Kirk had a way of of flowing the the information and the conversation so easily. When it's like, damn, forty five minutes had already passed. So I re listened a couple of times. Each time I've kind of picked up more and more. Um, I don't know if there's anything. Uh, interesting you got just from like a entertainment standpoint from it before we dive into what we saw. Well, it was my, it's my first true crime podcast. I, I've never Same listened here. to a true crime pro podcast before. And I mean, <laughs> a lot of people were saying this, like if this is what all true crime podcasts, I want all of them. Yeah. Which I'm assuming that they're not all this good. Yeah. Um, and that's why Kirk is a genius. Um, yes. Yeah, so one. One thing I noticed that I really liked that Kirk did um, was just during each interview, he would kind of stop the interview and explain it. Yes. And yes. That, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, yes. Like uh, in the interview with Anne, he goes, listen, like she's an 80 year old woman. I like it how he, he gives you that information halfway through. He doesn't throw it in the beginning or throw it at the end. He kind of says, listen, I'm not entirely sure I'm believing her story. Uh, this is the reasons why. And uh, also in the interview with uh, Mark, uh, when he was in Vermont and you could you could barely hear it, he goes like, "Listen, I, I understand it's not the best sound quality, but you, you got to stick with us here." And then then afterwards, he kind of goes through and says, "Okay, so this is what he said happened on the night of Jennifer Face's disappearance." So let's uh, let's just jump right into it. There was a uh, it. It started off strong. I mean, it, it, it kind of, I don't know if this is one of those, you know, fast forward to the end kind of beginnings to a series where the case is going to wrap up with this polygraph test. I'm not sure who the polygraph test is about. I'm going to assume it was done to uh, Kevin, uh, the, the, you know, the, the person who's been talked about. His name's Boston. The series is, is written after him. But uh, it wasn't touched. It was brought up kind of as before the first advertisement even hit. And it was not mentioned again for the rest of the episode. So I'm not sure if that was done kind of before they kind of planned everything out. They're like, okay, so this is going to be the beginning. And then the final episode or, you know, maybe the penultimate episode is going to be based upon the, the polygraph test. That seems to be, I mean, Kirk says, he's like, I'm stepping out and it could all be determined who did this based upon this polygraph test. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting, how Kirk was able to, to just kind of throw that out there. Like, hey, listen, there is a conclusion, a, a semi-conclusion out there. And the end all be all is this polygraph test. And, and then he kind of will show us how he got there. So I thought that was a very interesting way to start off the show. Yeah, and, it, was a, uh, it was a stinger of sorts, um, like a classic TV and movie. Mm -hmm kind of trope that like here's some here's something to look forward to and mm -hmm. think like keep it in the back of your head while we go through the story. Mm. Yes, because the entire time I was like, okay, uh I'm just assuming I, I'm not entirely sure that it was Kevin. Uh it could be Jennifer Faye's sister. It could be there was mm -hmm. there was mention of uh her best friend who refused to talk to them. It could have to do with her. There, there's a whole bunch of whole bunch of people this polygraph test could be so the first thing Kirk kind of talks about in this is how this story didn't really receive any media coverage in the area. And that's what I'm really hearing from, from a lot of people. Obviously, you and me were in our 20s. Uh, we were born after 1989. 
there's no way we would have heard of this. But I listened, I talked to people who were 10. I talked to people who were 20. I talked to people who were in high school. And I mean like high school is like right next to Brockton. And they just never heard of this story until I bring it up to them. It's, it's incredible just to see how different it is now with the internet and everything like that. How this this would have been if there's a news story where a girl in Plainville goes missing, or a girl in uh, somewhere in, you know, the Western Massachusetts goes missing. It, it's all it's not just statewide news; it's national news. So I, I find that really interesting uh, to see how they could uh, to see to see how like no one really knew about it because Bob. Uh, what's his name? The first journalist said Bob Ward didn't really uh, hear about it until years and years later where he saw her on, I believe he said a milk carton. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I, I think that's probably one of the, let's say the main reason why this case kind of just slipped away and, you know, no one was really brought to justice or anything. It, it, it's because I'm, I'm sure this happened all the time because people just didn't hear about it. It's not something you really talked about if it's if it's not really in the newspapers and it, it, you know you're not kind of a ambulance chaser you're not gonna you're not gonna hear these things so uh that that i just thought that was interesting i don't know if you heard anything different from anyone in regards I, to I haven't heard anything different um well a couple tweets i saw were um like kirk thank you so much why didn't like couldn't you have helped mm. sooner which is yeah. kind of it, it's like um like thanks to the internet it's like this is actually possible now. If yeah. you, if if this was um, even five years ago, it might not have had like the, he might not have had the capability of getting mm. all this info. Yeah, no, I mean, and Kirk Kirk said he found the case. I believe he said he found it on Reddit. Reddit, yeah. Uh, and that we actually we actually have a uh, case Reddit. If you go to r slash uh, the case pod, there's a there's some good discussion going on there about this and, and different theories and things like that. So check that out if you can. So I found that interesting that just no one, like not, not even like people in media barely knew about this. Uh, Bob Ward knew about it, but that was after he he saw it on a milk cart and he decided to start looking into it. And it's just, it, it, it's just, it, it's refreshing to know that, you know, Kirk saw this, took an interest in it, decided to go for it. So that's a, uh, that was that was a good like jumping off point i think to, to kind of start off saying like hey listen there's there were some because you know there are some documentaries out there that come out and they're true crime they're about jeffrey epstein they're about people you've heard of before uh aaron hernandez things like that and like you know what they're coming from and this it, it's really all for the most part and to everyone not involved it's new information coming left and right so uh i, I really enjoyed that i also liked how kirk did state right after his we'll get to the uh yvette interview but right after that interview he said listen the main problem i have with true crime documentaries docuseries podcast is that there's some sort of bias uh, i know kirk has talked before about the uh making a murderer uh netflix documentary about how that is very one-sided and then there's another podcast i think it's called like debunking a murderer or, or there's something of that and if you listen to one if you watch the Netflix series, you're like convinced this guy's a murderer. If you listen to the podcast series and you're convinced, uh, no, if you listen to the Netflix series, you're, yeah, you, you're convinced he's innocent. If you listen to the podcast, you believe he actually did it. So Kirk makes it very apparent very soon. He says, I'm going to try my hardest to not have any bias in, in this case. But he does admit like, listen, I like these people I've talked with. Obviously, I want to see closure for them. I, I There will be certain biases that he can't stop himself from having in that, which I, th I think I've never heard that before in a true crime, anything. I I've watched a lot of true crime documentaries on Netflix and I've never heard that. Like, listen, uh, there is bias out there and we're going to talk about when, when there is bias shown, but we're going to try to remain as neutral as possible. So I, I really liked, I really found that super, super cool of Kirk to do. Uh, well, that's Kirk. He's uh, he's he's going to be open about everything. He's going to explain it to you. He's going to say what what they're actually thinking. They're you know you're not going to say oh I bet there's a bias. He's going to tell you. Yes, and and because I, I think he wants this to be, he he doesn't he wants 
if you want to find information about this case, you go and you listen to the podcast. You go to the casepodcast.com. He doesn't want it to be like, oh, you know, they left this big chunk of information out that makes it seem like this person did this. And there's another podcast spot. Mm-hmm. I think he wants it all to be in one central location, uh, which which I think is going to be fantastically done by, uh, by Kirk and Steve. So let's just jump into the first interview they had. So Jennifer Fay went missing. November 14th, 1989. It was a Tuesday. And she was out partying. And her sister, Yvette, sat down with Kirk to kind of talk about what her sister was like, uh, you know, the struggle she had growing up. Um, And the one thing I, I found interesting about it is Yvette says early on in the interview that she was on the up and up. She said that Jen was on... Like, you know, she was she was in good hands at that time. But then later on in the interview, when you're hearing about what conspired at this party, it doesn't sound like she was on the up and up. It sounds like she was still going through a lot of troubles, whether it be addiction, you know, partying, drug addicts, boys, uh, drinking. And and that kind of struck me when uh, Yvette's like, oh, she had a favorite kind of alcoholic beverage. And it was uh, mm-hmm. it was two liters of seagram's like seltzer or something like that and it's like well how how much can you really be on the up and up you know if you still have a a favorite alcoholic beverage at 16 Mm -hmm. so uh i thought that was just interesting to to dive into and obviously yvette has a purse close personal connection uh she hasn't seen her sister in over 30 years uh you know you look back on it and you, you know nostalgic makes you kind of forget how a person could have been so, so I, but I do think she did do a good job of just describing like, Hey, listen, there was a, uh, chins placed on my sister. She, she, she did have a pattern of running away from home, but she constantly told people when she was running away from home and, and, and things of that sort. And, you, and they knew where they, where she was, she was at yes. her aunt's house. Which, uh, which see, I'm not too familiar with, uh, with runaways and, 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 mm-hmm in that but i believe like just letting people know where you are when you run away just sounds to be like the the best bet you got to get out of the situation and you're able to still communicate with people and let them know that you're safe like when she was staying at her aunt's house you know her mom her family knew she was safe that's what kind of made this whole driving off to california thing so it seems so ridiculous uh we'll get to that in a little bit but um but yeah, so so the night, so they went out partying. Uh, sounds like she was trying to make a call for more drugs of some sort, uh, according to Mark, who now lives up in Vermont. They talk talked to him for a little bit, and he was the last person to see, um, well, the last person to come out, you know, the last witness to say he saw Jennifer Fay. And originally, I believe he said that he saw them get into a. He saw her get into a brown truck, but uh, I believe at one point in the podcast it says that he says that is not true. So, uh, but but from other accounts, uh, the brown truck was there. So yeah. it's uh, it, 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 it it's interesting to see what kind of role he plays uh, going forward. I'm not entirely sure if he's going to it like what what side he's on if he's kind of on the, the side of kevin or if he's on the side of you know of, of the phase and, and trying to trying to get them figured out but uh it, it, it was nice that he he was able to uh that kirk was able to track him down and talk to him about what happened that night i know the audio wasn't the best it was dogs barking yeah. and stuff like that but like kirk said he, i mean you got to work with what what you're working with so that was a. Uh, just on that segment um, mm-hmm. of Kirk of Kirk breaking that down, what he's saying, um, it one thing that might help you out um, for anyone who hasn't listened or just wants to listen to it back, look at the map while he's describing it, because you get a, a much better understanding of what's going on. Um, there, there's also the I put out a promo on uh, Instagram that has the map in it while Kirk is explaining it. Mm. You can kind of you can kind of follow like where the brown car could have been, and, and the exact corner where um, she got into the car. Yes, it showed, and it, it 
I, I like it how, though it wasn't mentioned in the story, it does show the house of Kevin and the of the two Kevins there because it, it shows that they probably were driving from their house, picked her up, and then who knows where where they went, what happened to her. So I, I do think I like like you said, definitely check out the casepodcast.com under documents. There's a there's a good map of it that that, that explains everything that kind of we believe happened that night. So 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 there was Kevin's account, and then there was a which I found this very strange that when they contacted the Brockton Police Department, it was still under investigation, and so they were not able to release any of the. Uh, uh, of the documents that they have on it under the Freedom of Information Act, which normally I understand. I understand if it's an if it's an ongoing investigation, you don't really want to you know throw a wrench in things and, and kind of start making things public. But it sounds to me like if it wasn't for Kirk, this case would be would be cold ten years from now, fifty years from now. I don't know how much of an ongoing investigation there was uh, before Kirk got involved and started gathering together information. So my thought. Is when I heard that they did not release any documents to Kirk and Steve was that it's because there is no documents. Uh, I, I think that the detective who was on the case kind of you know said, "Hey, listen, reach out to and Desmond, uh, and, and, Desmond. and uh and you know she'll tell you what she does." And I'm not entirely sure that it like Kirk said, it's a it, there's a story about, you know, corruption. And, and I don't think, like you said about Ann Desmond, he doesn't believe that she is lying mm -hmm. uh, to him or that like she believes that what she said is true. But when she goes on, and so, so like I said, she was the detective who was the lead investigator on the case. And she came up with it and she was like, oh, I got a call from a Secret Service agent down in Florida who said he had a prisoner who confessed with, uh, who confessed to, you know, taking a girl and running away on a motorcycle. First of all, there's just so many questions brought up there. Mm -hmm. One, uh, why is it Secret Service? Was the man arrested for, you know, trying to kill the president or doing counterfeit money, which are the two things that the Secret Service does? Uh, there's no name given to the Secret Service person. There's no name given to the, to the uh, criminal who apparently did this, uh, how would the Secret Service agent know Anne and know that she was working this case? That seems very strange. And the same thing when Anne talks about later on in the interview, when she says, uh, oh, the hitchhiker who, who picked up a random hitchhiker was told that she was a runaway from Massachusetts. Then the driver decided to go call the police, let her know of it. And then the police did not end up getting the girl, but they ended up contacting Brockton police. It, the whole thing just seems to be like a kind of like a, uh, just a whole bunch of errors going on. It's and bad I, police work 101. Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's terrible police work. They're not leaving a trace of anything. There's, there's no, I, I, I bet there's no records of phone calls made. I, I'm like, like Kirk said, there's no proof of these pamphlets with, of missing persons being given out in Massachusetts. They said it was all over California. I have a I have a hard time believing that. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, that that this is just kind of her. You know, she's eighty years old. She you know did her job. She's retired and she's just she's like, listen, this is this is what it was because I'm sure that's what it was back then when there wasn't that much you know public uh, pressure on you due to everyone knowing about certain things. It was just kind of like, oh, another missing girl. You know, sixteen-year-olds run away all the time. I believe that was her her first one of the first things she said when uh, when she started talking to Kirk in the interview was, uh, you know, sixteen-year-old girls run away all the time, which was kind of concerning to me because a sixteen-year-old girl running away is still pretty like important in in my eyes. Like just just because she she ran away willingly to, with some guy in California, I mean, that's. I, I, I'm not entirely sure if that's kidnapping, but it sounds like kidnapping to me. Uh, when it One comes thing to didn't mention yet, it was it was before Ann Desmond. Um, mm -hmm. It was uh, Yvette was talking, and she yep. was talking about like the day after. Um, oh yes, happened. yes. Um, and they contacted the police, and they were told, "Don't touch anything. We're going to bring the dogs in. 
and get the scent. And none of that happened. Uh, they never showed up and they just, they said she, she ran away and that's it. Yes. I, I that, that was also uh, something where I, I, I don't know if that would happen today. Uh, I don't know if I would blame the mother on that or if I would blame the police. Like how, if you're in the mother situation, how are you not saying like constantly calling the police? Like, are you coming by? Are you coming by? Mm -hmm. But then again, if you're naive mm -hmm. about this stuff and you uh, believe the police are going to do their job, why should you, you know, have any doubt until it's two weeks later and you say, well, whatever sentence in that room is completely lost and, uh, and you know, they're just convinced they ran away. So Anne, Anne did say that she went down and she heard this motorcycle story from uh, Jennifer's friends, which Kirk says that everyone they talked to, and there's even a couple interviews at the end of, with her cousin and uh, with Yvette um, talking about, uh, do you think that she drove away to California? And they say, no chance. They say, no way. This is not something that, that, Mm -hmm. That is plausible. And I, I'm starting, I, this is coming out of complete ignorance, but I could see uh, someone planting fake witnesses at the scene because it doesn't sound like they did too, too much work. Um, if everyone says, Hey, we never told this story, but Anne is convinced she talked to someone who's to say that uh, a buddy of whoever actually picked her up, uh, said, oh, yeah, no, she went away to California with a mysterious man on a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's what it sounds like to me. She probably had, she probably, a couple people came up to her, talked to her. That was the story they all gave. And she said, well, that sounds good enough. That sounds good enough for me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, so I don't think, I don't think Anne would have necessarily uh, done the same I, I think i think a bunch of things would happen if, if this case were to take place today i don't think she would have done the same job i think she would have probably went into this a little bit harder uh but also she you can tell she did not give she, she did not do a lot of like kirk said doubting when it, when it came to this and mm -hmm. uh and perhaps that was because you know she was lacking resources like like they said she was the only detective on this case who knows how many other cases she was working on at the time so it could have been like, okay, well, we have a bigger lead on this murder case. Let's go, let's, you know, let's go try to solve that instead of dealing with something where we don't have any definite proof of anything. Mm -hmm. So it started out with like if they're assuming that it's a it's a runaway or just because she was into drugs and that was known mm -hmm. that they're not gonna do their best job in the investigation. They're ha they're mm -hmm. half-assing it already before even starting. So they're just going to go with the first piece of information that they're going to go with, I guess. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you're going to half-ass uh, anything, I mean, you think a police investigation would be something you would just, you would pray that, you know, like Kirk said, what if this was your mom? What if this was your sister, your daughter? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you'd like to think that the police would not half-ass this and just kind of go with what they said, especially when there's no, it'd be one thing if, you know, uh, a week later, Jen called up and said, Hey, I'm in California. I'll be here for a bit. Uh, I ran away with my boyfriend or, or, or whatever, which, which sounds like she was prone to do, uh, was run away, but she would always let her family know where she was. And, uh, and, and, and I think Yvette, uh, when, or I believe it might've been her cousin, uh, when asked if the California theory could be true, said, uh, there's no way she would do this. She loved her baby brother more than anything. She would never want to be away from him for a long period of time. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think that just shows that the uh, the, Brock, the Brockton Police Department did not do a good job. And I don't know if they're trying to cover up for it now in not releasing any uh, any evidence to to, uh, to Kirk and Steve when they asked for it. But yeah, that was that was just not a good look. Um, also, who, who's motorcycling across country in November? So I did look this up. So this is this is a little uh, I did look up the temperature in Boston that day. I didn't I couldn't find it for Brockton. Uh, so it was a low of 42, high of 69. So it wasn't extremely cold, but for the people I know who motorcycle, they usually have their motorcycles put away by yeah. mid-November. It, it's not something where you know you're just gonna drive down from New Hampshire 
go to a random city of Brockton and be like, hey, let's drive across country to California. So that that too is a, a great point. And uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, why and just completely bought that. So, so that was kind of like the big takeaway I think people got from episode one was that uh, the police are not the know-all be-all in, in this. It's, it's kind of like, okay, Kirk says this is going to be a developing theme in upcoming episodes, you know, uh, not necessarily uh, just just police incompetence, them not doing their job. So I'm interested to see if, if that's just with the Brockton Police Department. If if I know uh, Kirk and Steve went down to South Carolina, if they experienced similar things down there, but it's uh, definitely, definitely something I'm looking forward to in regards to that. So anything you else have to say about Anne? Um, no, I think we go. We're good. Just the, yeah. the the motorcycle story. It's 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 odd that like they would even like blink twice at like they wouldn't blink twice at it. It's it, it's it's a made up story. Like it's it sounds made up. It sounds like something a teenager would come up with. It's it's like a it's like a like a teenage film. Yes. Way with a with a cool guy on a motorcycle. Yeah. Or it's just like, oh, or, or that's what one person told you. So it's just like, oh, yeah. I mean, well, also you got to understand that perhaps these people were in, not necessarily the people that were close to Jen, but other people might believe this just from hearsay. Like, oh, where's Jen? Oh, she, you know, she she drove away on a motorcycle with a guy in California. That's a lot uh, easier to say than, oh, you know, she was hanging out with uh, with this yeah. guy. Then, then they saw this brown truck come and pick her up. So it, it's very... There's there's definitely uh, a consensus between the people that know Jen that she, there's no way she would have just up and left on a motorcycle. So that is uh, that was kind of where the episode kind of faded off is 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 with uh, people saying there's no there's no way Jen mm -hmm. Jen did that. And uh, I did I do want to talk about the title of the episode for a little bit. It was titled Jennifer, and it seems to me like from coming up in episode two, what was posted at the end of episode one is that there was a lot of talk about this, about, I think we're going to, to meet Kevin uh, in the second episode. I know Kirk has tweeted out that the second episode is even better. Um, I'm sure that I'm sure Kevin is a very interesting fellow has, has a lot of backstory to him. Uh, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to that. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if the second episode is titled, uh, you know, Kevin or uh, it'd be weird if it was Boston. But I, I think I think that's kind of I could see that's how the podcast progresses is, is kind of each episode we're introduced into a new character and they give more information. So I, I think at that in that episode two tease, um, they mentioned Kirk like because everything has been picking up in real life. Yes, that the the podcast has to pick up. Um, yes, so I believe they're going to Walhalla in the next episode. Yes, so, so it's uh it's it's very exciting. Um, I can't wait for it. I'm I'm super pumped. I I it sucks that it's five days away, <laughs> and uh, but but I keep listening back to the first episode, yeah. and it's uh, oh I also wanted to mention the, the case is brought to you by Taser. Um, I forgot yeah, to, to, to mention that uh, Taser make great products, uh, self defense. Um, please check them out. If you if you use promo code Case, you get fifteen percent off. So. So uh, that, is there anything else you wanted to, to say about this episode, Harrison, or? I'm good. I loved it. Awesome. Yeah, no, it, it was really excellent. Like, uh, like, uh, like you said, this was the first time I ever listened to a true crime podcast. But, when you, but I think Kirk and Steve's idea isn't just to have it be a podcast, to have it be a website, to have it be you know, something – where it's it's interactive it's always growing it, it's not necessarily just something you listen to and then you're just done with it so i can't wait to see it feels like an event yes it really does so uh so i'm, I'm super excited to see that and uh we will talk to you uh want to make this a, a tuesday every tuesday thing sure sounds does that work for you every <laughs> let's, well, every tuesday well me and harrison will uh we'll break it down uh the previous episode and uh, if you'd like to join us or you, you have any interesting questions, uh, be sure to email uh, the case podcast at barstoolsports.com 
and uh, we'll see. I know, I know Kirk and Steve are also going to be doing a live stream kind of review or not review, but kind of recap of every episode. So that's looking forward to. So we will and talk to you next if Tuesday. Anyone wants to come on, if anyone wants to come on. Yes. With us, yes. That's always open. Yes, we are. We're very open to that. So uh, thank you, Harrison. Thank you to everyone who is listening. Thank you to Kirk and to Steve. And I will talk to you next week.